this is chapter one, Strawberry Lake, 1973 to 1975 in Everett, Michigan, where everything started before Morris Lake Monsters. This was the prequel. Everett, Michigan is located in the middle of the Lower Peninsula, above Grand Rapids and above Big Rapids, and east of Reed City. Everett, Michigan is the home to Strawberry Lake. At one time it was a campground. Now there's homes situated all the way around it, but surrounding that is miles and miles of state land. However, if you go to Strawberry Lake, it is a private lake and you have to have permission to go. Part of Reed City's legacy, uh, logging, goes back a long time. Some of the old trees were as big as 10 feet in diameter. Um, they manage the land quite regularly now and the trees don't grow to that big any longer. You'll be hard pressed to find any trees that are uh, past their maturity level unless they're hardwood. Now this area, I'm pretty sure that um, the structure of this was being logged uh, made the Sasquatch relocate. Um, the Strawberry Lake had the campgrounds all the way around the lake. And over here to the right, which would be to the east, uh, that whole area was being logged. And I think they were displaced and um, that gave the opportunity for strange things like this to happen. From foul play, to drownings, to missing persons, to haunted areas, to brown bears being killed in the area and the clear cutting that finds weird things like mastodon bones and also UFO sightings. This all happened in the area in 1975. Everett's a weird area. An unidentified flying object was spotted on Friday, July 25th, 1975 at 12.36 a.m. by Mary Holmes, age 11. The object had green, red, and blue lights calling her mother Sharon to the window observant. Arnold Holmes and Gary and Lyndall Hornbuckle also observed it. Hmm. And the Teamster leader that went missing, Jimmy Hoffa, was even tied to the area. Jimmy Hoffa, have you heard the latest, brother, on the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa? The infamous, you know the man. Oh, I know you know the man. <laughs> Hoffa Trail leads to Osceola County. Acting on an anonymous tip, FBI authorities searched a cement block building at the intersection of M61 and M66 near Marion, believed to be a state highway department garage, according to Sergeant James Maturin, a state trooper in Reed City. And of course, they didn't find anything. Now, as far as I can read on these old reels that I have, that still have film in them that needs to be restored yet. The oldest recorded one we have is in 73 and I think this is uh, footage of 73 right here. Um, I don't remember any kind of encounters in 73 but in 75 that was the year that they uh, started doing the, the logging in that other area and that might have been the reason why the Sasquatch were displaced into a different area. At least that's what I'm thinking. And the other people here are some of my relatives that joined us in our first trip there. And that's my dad. Memory triggers. There are things that trigger old memories like uh, seeing an old video, um, looking at old pictures, um, meeting old friends or going back to where these incidents took place those trigger memories now this is when i returned to ever and uh little did i know i parked right in front of the museum and the museum held something that i didn't even know was in there well i knew it but i forgot about it and it didn't exactly register right away how important this uh, mastodon bone was. This mastodon bone was the whole reason why I ever came to ever. I was a kid like most kids. I was into dinosaurs and when my mother 
saw this article about this mastodon bone being found here in Everett. She found the camping area was here also, and that's how we started coming to Strawberry Lake in the first place. It's because of this very bone. Mastodon lower leg bones found July 1972 when Michigan Consolidated Gas Company was installing a new gas main on the east side of 80th Avenue between Two Mile Road and Three Mile Road. A large bone is the right fibula which has been coated with several coats of shellac for preservation. A smaller bone is the right fibula which has been broken in half. This next old Super 8 silent footage my mother tried to take at Strawberry Lake of me and Sammy and tried to get us together on film. I eventually cleaned this video up and I didn't uh, remember any of it until it was cleaned up and then it really unlocked the memories for me. This is a slow motion loop of uh, the little bit of footage that she tried to get and uh, I'll explain it more later. It is blurry. I'm going to get this restored. Uh, I don't imagine it being to look much better. This is as good as I can get it. Um, I was getting visited by Sammy, the juvenile Sasquatch, uh, right next to the water there while I was sitting in the canoe. Restoring fuzzy memories and the method I used to restore them. You find the trigger, you find your little fragment of your memory. This is a fuzzy memory. I left it fuzzy on purpose at Strawberry Lake. So this is a clear memory that you have. So this is your memory fragment. It's really short. You might have to repeat it a few times to remember everything in it but then what you do is you try to remember just before that memory fragment what happened just before that fragment that you remember okay if you can do that then you can just uh, try to remember just after that memory fragment what happened right after the part that you remember and when you remember that memory fragment and the one before it you're opening a book. You repeat this process and soon the memory will reopen. A whole day or a whole week or even much more unlocks itself using this method. You have to work at it and you have to do it over and over again until it completely unlocks itself. The memory is there, stored in a fragment. You just have to unlock it. But it can take a lot of time and it can take a lot of work. You just got to stick with it. Okay, the research uh, that I've done so far, and I still have to do more, the timeline uh, fits for 1975 as of our first visit. It was probably late July. This newspaper article came out in late July, and it was about an event in Leroy that had the Channel 13 eyewitness balloon, and my mother happened to caught it going across the lake and filmed it. And uh, Channel 13 eyewitness News crew was also, a couple of years later in 1977, the ones that covered uh, the taking of Mike in the Middleville State game area, several miles away from Strawberry Lake. Now our last visit of that year in 1975 was sometime in August, according to this uh, uh, report here of when the logging equipment um, was vandalized. So those are the time frames we're looking at, uh, late July and uh, late August of 1975. July, it must have been mid-July. Um, our first visit there in 75. The, the thing is, I don't remember much of the, t the, the two previous years going there um, camping. I remember bits and pieces of it. I don't remember any, any chimps. I don't remember any chimps the previous years, but in 75, they started, you know, the the logging over in that one area over by uh, um, that swamp in Whitmore Pond and the end of Strawberry Lake. And I think that drove the Sasquatch closer to, you know, and got them, you know, uh, out of their area. And Blue's the area that was being logged, which displaced the Sasquatch and they moved over to the camping areas. I think. Okay, that that time, I wanted to go for a hike, and uh, 
I did just meet uh, Randy and his friend Mark. I had uh, not hung around with them much. I had uh, met them on the merry-go-round in the playground there. <laughs> when they spun me around a whole bunch of times and I first learned that well, you can uh, get spun around enough, you can throw up. I didn't know that. I just thought it was fun until that happened. Uh, I got off the merry-go-round and threw up in the bushes. I didn't throw up all over the merry-go-round. And like, I was one of the last kids to like, hang on there uh, and stay on that long too. This is Randy, his friend Mark, and me at the merry-go-round. Okay, this is a list of witnesses. This is my older friend Randy and me. I was eight, he was 13. Both our mothers saw the quote-unquote chimps. And this is the list of the other kids that also saw or played with these chimps. This is Randy's friend Mark. Uh, he was the same age as Randy, about 13. And he was there the first time I was there in July. And he was there uh, the last couple days after uh, I was about ready to leave in August. He's the one that got blamed for um, the logging incident with Randy. These are the two teens that got blamed for that. Now this is Greg. Uh, Greg's father was a cop. Uh, Greg was about nine and he played with us for a while. This is Greg's sister. She was a little bit older. I think she was 11 or 12. Um, this is my sister. She was 12 at the time and she was hanging out with these three other girls. This is Randy's sister here. And this is all the kids together in a group. As far as finding witnesses for this, uh, this set of encounters happened so long ago. Uh, my older friend Randy, I did go look for him in Flint and I have not found him yet. I have to check some more records and see if I can find him. My other friend LR, I've been talking to him. I did find him. I haven't got him to go on camera yet. Um, there's a couple other witnesses I still have to look up yet and this is what I've got for you now. Um, you may have seen this video already, but uh, I'm adding it in here anyway. This is an interview with uh, Brandon Dangle Robinson, and uh, he met some of the witnesses. Alrighty then, I'm here today with uh, Brandon Robinson Dangle. What's up? What's up, man? God, glad to be here. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to ask Dangle a few questions about uh, some witnesses that he met with one time. Um, the witnesses that I can't get to come forward and, uh, you know, they have their reasons not to come forward. Uh, but Dangle was with me one time when we went to go talk to him and about um, um, some of the occurrences that happened back then in 1977 with the juvenile Sasquatch. The, the, um, the witnesses we went to go meet were uh, Tom and his wife. Tom was the uh, father of Tim, and Tom was the one that shot the juvenile Sasquatch. And we went to go meet them one day. You remember that, right, Dango? Yeah. And I'm uh, going to talk to Dango about uh, some of the witnesses he met once um, because they won't come forward. The witnesses were uh, Tom and his wife. Tom was, uh, <laughs> and Tom was uh, Tim's father, the one that shot the juvenile Sasquatch. Tom is Tim's father, the guy with the gun in every drawing here. And he's the one that shot the juvenile Sasquatch. And uh, um, they talked about it in front of us uh, um, for a while and, and Dango, you witnessed that, correct? Yes, sir. Um, Tom also talked about a book that he was writing um, and showed us a very large book that was supposed to be published after his death uh, from uh, either his, his wife or, you know, his surviving kids. Um, do you remember them talking about her? Do you remember Tom talking about yeah. their seeing the book at all? Yeah, for sure. Well, I appreciate you coming out and, you know, talking to me about this because, uh, you know, a lot of people aren't, aren't, aren't talking about this and at least you're a witness to some of the uh, witnesses that I've been trying to get to come forward and I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, thanks, Dango. Okay, that July visit, I wanted to go for a hike by myself. I wanted to go walk around the lake sometime during the day 
And uh, I forget what my sister and my mother were doing. My dad wanted to uh, take the canoe out and go fishing. Well, this is some old blurry footage of uh, the canoe we just got that year. A big 17-foot fiberglass, yellow banana-looking canoe we got from Montgomery Wards. And uh, we used to have to rent a boat or go out in a raft or something before that, a couple years before that. And my dad was really happy to have this thing to go down rivers and, and small lakes and go fishing. And that's what he wanted to do, and I wanted to go on my hike. And uh, since I was familiar with the area, and, and, and I don't know why they did this when I was eight years old, but they thought I could I could do it. And, um, they agreed to let me go walk around the lake, and my dad was supposed to follow me around and um, on the shore of the boat while he's fishing and keep an eye on me. And, you know, the, the, there was campers everywhere. Um, and there was uh, um, the trail that went along the shoreline, along the campgrounds, and it had very often didn't go very much further into the woods. And uh... Now this is a recent look at what uh, Strawberry looks like today, even with the houses on it. Now straight across over there are the original houses and the original barn, which were farmhouses. And uh, you can see how nice and clear the lake is down here. I'm going to wash my hands a minute. It's a crystal clear lake and it's about 90 feet deep. Um, the lowest estimate is 80 feet, but since it's been a private lake, nobody really knows for sure. Over in that area where I'm pointing was where the nudist camp was, uh, over where that inlet was over there, and where most of our encounters took place. This area over here where I'm pointing, where that sailboat's over, was where we were camping. They agreed to do that, and I went on the, on the hike. I didn't get very far. Um, would it be to the east going in the back to where the logging uh logging equipment was and this was on the weekend when i did this and there was nobody working back there and uh i had seen them working there on like friday and i think this must have been a saturday because they were gone and the logging equipment was just sitting there and uh i wanted to go check it out and go walk around the lake because you know i was eight years old i thought that equipment was pretty cool but I got heading out there and I got like three quarters of the way and there was um, a few less campers in this area of where the Strawberry Lake met um, that swamp part and on the other swamp part was where they were logging. This is a view from Strawberry Lake to Old Strawberry Lake, the swamp and where the logging took place on the other side of this swamp here. And uh, for a little ways, the, the chimps that I was playing with, all four of them, had walked out with me and walked a little ways like we're a group. And apparently nobody saw this and we went off into the ferns. Uh, and we played uh, tag in the ferns for a little while and that was uh, right in between Strawberry Lake and the, the swamp and we haven't caught up to the logging equipment yet. And we played back there it seemed for a while. And uh, I guess my dad lost sight of me and, and came looking for me then. Uh, this is my drawing over the brief time that I walked with all four of them, my dad in the background there, fishing in the canoe. And uh, for a little ways, the, the chimps that I was playing with, all four of them, had walked out with me and walked a little ways like we're a group. And apparently nobody saw this and we went off into the ferns. Uh, and we played uh, tag in the ferns for a little while and that was... Uh, right in between Strawberry Lake and the, the swamp, and we haven't caught up to the logging equipment yet. And we played back there, it seemed, for a while. And uh, I guess my dad lost sight of me and, and came looking for me then. Okay, this area back then was already clear cut, so the ferns were getting a lot more sun and they were a lot bigger. And this is where I was playing hide and seek with a uh, four juvenile Sasquatch, and uh, of course I thought they were chimps. Um, I must have been doing that for a while because that's when my dad, uh, you know, parked the canoe and came looking for me. And and uh, the one I called, we called Sammy, uh, the one that was about the same size as me, tackled me when my dad got near. And uh, I didn't really know what was going on. After he had me pinned down, he did about the same thing he did a couple years later. And uh, 
it was making some sort of noise and I really couldn't move or scream or anything and I couldn't hear anything I could hear my dad calling out for me but I couldn't answer him and it seemed like that didn't last for very long and my dad must have left and went to another spot and I didn't I was eight years old I didn't really think a whole lot about it um, it seemed like it happened really quick to me and uh, I just continued playing and went up to the next spot where that tree was hanging over um, that back swamp area. I think that tree that's in the water is the one that I was hanging in. See, look at those, look at the beaver damage over there. I'm not even sure if that could still be the tree. It was a living tree back then, and it was one they left alone. It seemed like it was leaning over the water or something like that, and, uh, this is the best I can remember it. I sat up in there with uh, Sammy for a little bit before we moved on to the logging equipment. I'm staying right up here in these young trees is where it happened. Where the logging equipment was. I came around this side though. Pretty sure. God, I can't remember. You gotta remember that road over there that you could see yeah. in between Strawberry Lake and here. Looking this way, you could see the logging equipment because that's how far the wit the witness spotted the other. Uh, you know, the teens in you know all black with black hoods on and everything. Busting up the equipment. I got another tree uh, with them. Um, we weren't far from the logging equipment. You know, a lot of the um, the bigger hardwoods were still up. Um, if there if there was a maple or an oak or something like that, those big trees were still up. But all the all the pines and all the uh, uh, the small birch and stuff like that were all taken down. And uh, we made our way over to these these chimps were following me and they made made their way over to the, the log equipment. The first one that I went to go look at was um, like a front end loader. And, you know, I just looking around, it was locked. That one was locked. I couldn't get inside of it because I wanted to go look around. And uh, This is my art of me checking out the front end loader and, uh, you know, little juvenile Sasquatch hiding here and there. I was really interested. And we went over to the other piece of equipment, which was like a, a crane that would uh, pick up the logs and uh, had some big pinchers in front of it or something. And that one was unlocked. I got up on the on the crane tracks and found it was unlocked and I got inside and this all happened really fast. Yeah, even with me explaining it, um, it still had, it seemed like it happened really fast. Um, I got in there and started playing on and I sat in the seat and I was just moving the levers around. And making and making truck noises and car noises and stuff like that and it, it doesn't seem like it was more than just a few seconds uh sammy pushes me out of the way and gets in that seat and just grabs one of those levers and he starts pulling at like this and he gets his feet up on the lever and he's, <laughs> but he's not making any noise he's not screaming or anything like that and it seemed like it was pretty violent to me and i like got around the back of the seat and i was going to make my way out when he starts beating stuff with this this lever, he pulled it off somehow. They must have sheared the pin in it or something. And he started beating on the instruments and on the on the um, on the glass. And another one was up on on that glass, licking it. And he moved back and like grabs the 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 lever away from him and starts beating the crap. You know, this is after he broke the freaking window when he starts beating the crap out of the thing. I wanted to get out of there because it was really noisy. And I knew like some of the campers would hear it and uh, they'd blame me for it. I knew I didn't want to get in trouble. So um, I tried to make my way out of there and they're beating the crap out of that thing. There was at least four of them. I don't know if there's any more, but I, I like kind of, when I got out of the, the crane, I ran all the way around the back of that swamp. Well, this is me going over to the crane, standing up on the tracks and uh, finding it's unlocked and getting inside and playing around and making the car noises and then Sammy gets in and pushes me out of the way with his goony sister over there licking the glass. Well he starts beating the crap out of the thing and 
I decided to get out of there. Swamp, and then when I got up to, um, up with that trail that leads around Strawberry Lake in the campground, there was some guy, um, some camper coming out there checking out that noise. Just like I, you know, knew what would happen because it was loud. And uh, he's the one that was the witness in the paper that stated that, um, you know, that he saw teenagers uh, running from the scene with hoodies on and all black clothing in the middle of the, you know, um, in the middle of the summer. Again, here's the highlighted uh, police report in the article in the, in the newspaper in 1975. Because he, he stopped me and asked me, he's going like, who's back there? Do you see one? I was going like, no, I didn't see anything. I hear that back there. That's noisy. I said to him, and he, you know, and he's going like, oh, those teenagers are back there being on that, that logging equipment. I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever, and I'm like, went on my way, and I was still going to go around Strawberry Lake, and I ended up going um, all the way around the rest of the way. And I think my dad was ahead of me looking, and not finding, and ahead of me, and I was behind him. And uh, about uh, three-quarters of the way around the lake, there was a... Um, um, a camp store that was in an old barn and I'd, I'd stopped there to get some water at the drinking fountain and somebody had spotted me and they took me back to camp and said they've been looking for me for like three hours and I, I can only account for like 45 minutes or something like that or maybe I took even longer than that to walk around the lake but it didn't seem like it was gone that long um but that's that incident that was July and uh Nobody believed me about it. My parents didn't believe me about it. They were going like, oh, you're playing with raccoons. There's no such thing as, you know, uh, monkeys in the woods or chimps in the woods. Um, and we ended up going home um, at the end of our stay then we were going to uh, return in August. And uh, that was going to be a longer stay. And um, we went home. Okay. The return. Um, that was sometime in mid-August. Um, the the one dates in July, um, some mid-July, I figured that out from the, the footage, obviously, that my mother had of the Eyewitness 13 balloon that went over and was over in um, Leroy at an event. Leroy's a town out there, and they had an event with that balloon, and it went over. So that put me in that time frame, and when I came back in... Um, it must have been mid-August something. It you know it's it it takes a while for put these papers out, and like uh, I can only go by the dates of the papers come out, and then like guess sometime before then is when the events happen. We went back, and uh, for our second uh, visit, we were going to stay longer, and uh, my parents hadn't yet met Randy, my older friend that I told you about, and. Uh, he was a part of a, a, a little nudist colony where there was a couple families that would stay there the whole summer. And uh, they paid to have the this area with signs and raw roped off and the, the campground or their area was away from the other campers. And it was in a you know mosquito infested spot where there was a, a pond behind it and nobody wanted to camp there anyway, but they put them there. Nudist camp location area on the map and the nudist kids me included <laughs> um my parents didn't know about them yet i think uh well they found out when we got back in august a little bit uh later randy was without his friend mark for a while and he was hanging around with me more but when i got back in august he was like uh well, you know those chimps you know my my mom gave one a name and called it Sammy, and, and I've been playing with it all summer, and the other kids have been playing with it. I'm like, really? That's interesting. And, like, he's telling me this while we're in our swimming spot, and uh, he goes, yeah, yeah, there he is right there. He's going, Sammy, come here. And Sammy pops his head out of the brush right there, and he's, like, uh, saying something to Sammy, and he splashes water on him, on his face. You know, he's just got his face sticking out. And I remember this so distinctly the water running down his face and this really confused look that he had on his face and and like i thought it was kind of mean that he was doing that because he told me he goes like oh chimp take water watch what happens when i splash him with water i was gonna like, do that no don't do that he doesn't like it he's gonna like oh no watch what happens and then he splashed him a, a few more times and all of a sudden sammy started splashing back he's gonna like come on it's a splash fight randy says and like i started joining in and then the other three the other Sasquatch that was the same size as Sammy, the female, and the, the two other small ones, um, I get to 
those in a minute and the explanation to them. Um, they came out and got in the splash fight immediately, and it, and it turned into a, a, a huge splash fight. Nobody was around. Um, if somebody came around the corner, um, they would immediately run in the brush or run up a tree or something. And uh, this went on, it seemed like, for a minute or so, and finally they turned around and started splashing in the front. They turned around like they were digging and, like, splashing in between their legs, and, and just we had to give up. It was, it was so funny. I remember that so distinctly. I, <laughs> that was a really cool memory. And this is the art of the splash fight that we got in with the four chimps, or, you know, juvenile Sasquatch. And uh, Sammy, the female, and the two smaller ones. My mother had found out about the uh, my friends, and my dad actually made friends with Randy's dad, who, to make this m more confusing, Randy's dad was also named Randy. So it was confusing for us, too, um, having three Randys around. So I was the third, and my older friend was number two. <laughs> Of course, his dad was number one, Randy, but um, um, they both enjoyed fishing, my dad and Randy's dad, so they took off a lot. And uh, one time when my mother was down at the camp, at Randy's camp, and talking to Randy's mother, and uh, it was kind of odd because, you know, um, they didn't mind if I ran, you know, around nude, but, um, you know, because I was eight years old, I didn't care, and, and, and Randy would, and, and his mother, and then next thing i know my mom's taking off her clothes and talking to randy's mom and at some time when this is happening um uh, randy's mom is telling my mother about the newspaper article that i haven't found yet um because i have to go up there and look through the microfiche they don't have it online or anything like that but i gotta go look through old physical papers like this and everything um i have to go back up there i found all these other articles i haven't found this yet but um she picks it up and says, the the circus was here. The circus workers came through here about a year or so ago. And, and they had figured out that these were just chimps that the circus people left. And two of them had the babies. That's why there was two smaller ones. And somehow they survived. And she named it Sammy. And my mother actually got to see Sammy come out about like 20 yards away. And uh, um, Randy's mother to go to feed it at a tree and leave the... the they didn't, they didn't let the adults get close, but they would, you know, they let the females get close enough to leave them food. They would never let um, my dad and Randy's dad see them. And matter of fact, those two thought um, all of us were in a big joke because all the kids were seeing it. And, um, you know, my mom and Randy's mom were also seeing them and they just thought we were joking the whole time. So uh, um, my mom finally figured out that I wasn't crazy then. There was, you know, actual, you know, what we thought were chimps there and uh, to make matters even more confusing that winter we had i mean for me as a kid that winter we went it was the, the winter before that summer we had went to go see that circus that was supposedly came through there and uh i rode the elephants and met tarzan zubini and, and like they had chimps there so I just thought they were the same chimps that I'd met. So I had my guard down on that and, you know, the other kids were playing with them. So, um, it really, um, it really made it, you know, like, a, you know, it seemed like it was, everything was okay because nobody ever saw the adult Sasquatch. Going to the circus the winter before that summer and playing with the chimps and the elephants and then hearing about the circus coming through and losing chimps made it all real easy to believe that there were chimps. Okay, so my mom figures out um, that this is real. She tries to get it on, on video with her old uh, uh, Kodak uh, Super 8 camera with no sound on it, and it's blurry 99% of the time. I had like C batteries in it, and it was like left over from my uh, my dad using it for hunting for years um, at his hunting camps. So it was an old camera even then. Even though technology didn't move around or move along very fast back then, um, it was still an old camera and it wasn't that great, but um, it was adequate. But that's when she tried to get the footage of, um, of me sitting with Sammy when I was uh, in the canoe when I was on the shore. And uh, that's the footage that, that triggered all my memory of that. Um, even though all these years I, I, I watched some of those um, pieces of footage of the camping there. Um, I didn't remember the, the chimps until I, I saw that 
footage restored. I restored it enough to where I can make out what was going there. And then his hand on my shoulder and like, it it was like, hit me like a semi truck. I mean, it was like, I remembered everything. Um, um, it, it was really bizarre. Okay, the Strawberry Lake Chimp uh, footage right here, I've cleaned up several different times and this is about the best I can do right now until I get enough money to have a real professional clean up the the old uh, reels. Now these are the two small ones that ran in the tree and uh, yeah, I know they're hard to see, but uh, believe me, I remember hearing them and seeing them run up to the tree and uh, rocking the boat a little bit there. He's moving me around with his arm around me, but uh, this is the best I can do for now. And uh, he's right there in that red area. You can see his hand on my shoulder there. You can see a little bit of a silhouette of his head. This is the art I did of it to show you where it is. This is the best I can do for now. It was something I should have remembered a long time ago. Um, I remembered all the Morris Lake monsters, you know, the story that happened at the barns that was um, in 1977, and this was 1975. And it was an hour and a half drive um, from like our farmhouse to um, north to ever. And it isn't a great distance, but he found me later. A couple of years later, about a year and a half later, he started showing up at the barn. And uh, it, you know, like I said, it's not a great distance, but how did he find me? Um, that's something you know um, that we probably can't understand. I just, it, it wasn't a different Sasquatch. I know it was the same Sasquatch by a lot of the things he showed me and a lot of the, the, the things that he did. And uh, I wondered why I didn't uh, you know, remember then at Morris Lake at the farm of the encounters back at Strawberry Lake, there was a reason that I'm going to get to later um, when I go to school because uh, eventually we leave Strawberry Lake and there isn't very many encounters to speak of, you know, other than them popping out of the, um, you know, the brush every once in a while. Um, basically what, I, what I've shown you is, is some of the um, the better encounters, it wasn't uh, a whole lot of them. They were pretty sporadic and they're, uh, most of them were pretty insignificant. Um, this is the distance on the map from uh, Everett to Elto, where our farmhouse was at. About 100 miles and about uh, an hour and a half drive. Not a great distance, but still, how did he find me? How did he even know where to look? My mother started driving a bus at Blessed Sacrament School in, in Grand Rapids, which is a Catholic school. I was going to private school, and uh, this had happened after the summer. I don't know if she had the job set up or whatever, but um, they decided to put me in this school. So when I left Strawberry Lake and I got done with summer vacation and I had to go back to school, I was going back for the first time into a Catholic school, and I had to get dressed up for it. And I thought I had to wear a tie. I didn't even know that. And I, I wore a clip on. Me and a tie going to a little Catholic school called Blessed Sacrament School in Grand Rapids, Michigan. But anyway, when we got through the, the, the subject, the thing that we had to talk about um, on our first day there was what we did during summer vacation. Everybody was you know, talking about going to Cedar Point or um, New York or Hawaii or Florida or whatever. And uh, I get up and I, I start telling a story about, you know, these hippie people in the nudist colony and you know that i hung out with and and their their kid and playing with chimps in the woods and going fishing and catching snakes and all this and this is me in my first day of catholic school the only guy wearing a tie I didn't have to wear one and uh we're explaining what we did in summer vacation and i'm talking about monkeys in the woods and i got a hell of a reaction Boy, did that not go over well. Um, the teacher, uh, you know, thought I was lying and uh, the kids thought I was lying and making it up. And uh, it got to be a pretty big ruckus, a pretty big uh, 
um, dealing. The kids almost started fighting with me, and I had one friend stand up for me, and um, his name was LR, and um, he stood up in front of the class and, and told everybody that I wasn't a liar. And it was if he said there's monkeys in the woods, there's monkeys in the woods. I mean, I didn't tell them like I thought monkeys were naturally in the woods. I, I told them that, you know, that we thought that the, the circus had lost the monkeys, but. Um, well, this is when my friend LR stood up for me in front of the class and told everybody I wasn't a liar. And I can't say I've had too many friends that have done something like that in my lifetime. Thanks, LR, for sticking up for me, man. I didn't tell them like I thought monkeys were naturally in the woods. I, I told them that, you know, that we thought that the, the circus had lost the monkeys, but, um... They really thought I was lying, and I, I wouldn't uh, change my story, so they eventually brought me down to the office. And that's when I got into it with the nuns, and the nuns were, you know, the, the first thing they did is hit me over the, the knuckles with a, with a ruler, and, and, and I still wouldn't change my story. They started paddling me. I still wouldn't change my story. <laughs> got really weird after that <sighs> this younger nun that just joined or whatever kind of a heavy set gal comes over after a while and and uh after my my ass was really sore and i was sitting in the corner and i didn't cry either i didn't let them know that it hurt but um she said she knew what they were she said they're uh um they're evil nephilim and that they were uh um, bad to be around and sexually deviant and she just went on and on and well, the old nuns were referring to the Hebrew Bible and the, the reference to the Nephilim um, the Nephilim were in those early days and after that where the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore children of them basically they're uh, children of fallen angels that had sex with uh, uh, female humans um, all early sources refer to the sons of heaven as angels, and the uh, third century BCE onwards, uh, references found in the Enoch literature and the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Genesis and blah, blah, blah. Um, they refer them quite often in the Bible, and uh, that's what they were talking about. And uh, the old nun that spanked me, it seemed like she really enjoyed it. Well, she called me a devil child. And uh, I wasn't being that school for very long. <laughs> I decided that I had to go to counseling, and it got worse when um, my friend Randy had got blamed uh, for the and his friend for the the logging incident. And uh, I was upset about that because we were supposed to go up to the court for his court hearing, and I was supposed to testify you know, for him and, and our car broke down and I I thought, you know, I, thought he, I didn't know, you know, what was going to happen to him. I was only eight years old or nine years old and I thought, you know, it was going to be really bad. I got really upset and that was a problem. So when counseling, I guess they had me, uh, you know, they, they suggested to my parents that they, you know, since I was throwing a fit about this and the, the weird chimp thing was throwing a, a fit at school and a problem at school, they decided to actually hypnotized me the church did honest they so i could forget about randy and quit getting mad about it and i was really worried about him um you wouldn't think that would be a problem i guess but when we moved out to the the farmhouse and a year or so later that was a real problem because i didn't recognize sammy when he found me and uh Things would have went a lot different if I would have, you know, I wouldn't have had uh, the fear that I did. And at least that's what I tell myself. Um, things go really bad, and that's another chapter, and I'll get to that pretty soon. Um, and there's a chapter before that, too, with Mike, the boy, in the woods getting taken. So there's a lot to this encounter. Be working on some new art, replacing uh, some of the old art, out with the old and with the new. Um, getting the book done and getting more chapters done here pretty soon. Here's a sample. 
when Mike came into the barn and he went to the, the south side of the barn and he sat down on the pile of hay and I sat down in the other pile of hay, the distance between us was probably about 10 to 15 feet. That's what this picture represents. This is the time then I tried to get Mike to make different sounds, much like Tim was. And uh, I tried a whole bunch of different sounds. Here's how it went. Can you moo? Like a cow? Then I thought I could fool them with this half whistle, half humming sound that I could make that I don't even know where I learned it from, but I tried that. And then this is what happened when he answered back. He looked like his face was melting momentarily. I don't know how long it lasted, maybe for a few seconds, but I didn't give it as much thought. He was a ways away, and I thought it was my eyesight going. And I didn't pay any attention to it. I just started to approach him after that. I was gonna go check out his weird looking feet. Hey, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. It helps the channel. Appreciate it.